Yeah, so I'm like, in true fashion, I am trying to get this live demo to work. I might have to just undo a bunch of stuff and be happy with. Hello, hello, is that better? Sweet. Um, yeah, I'll also just speak louder. Cool. Uh, awesome, so as Kaz said, uh, my name is Niels. I work at Arena, which is a HR analytics company. Um, we mainly serve hospitals, and our main uh, product offering is, you know, we recommend job applicants for our clients to hire. So, I mean, with that premise, you can see why I'm kind of concerned about this particular topic. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'll, what I'll be talking about today are a few kind of high-level concepts trying to define discrimination in the first place and what fairness means, um, and then contextualizing that in machine learning. Um, and I'll be talking about a package that I wrote a couple months ago that tries to implement a few of these techniques. Cool, so what does bias have to do with ice cream? Um, just making sure this is the right slide deck. Yeah, okay. Sweet. Well, the, so, the, you know, bias has many meanings. And um, in statistics, it means a, a particular thing. And in a colloquial sense, it means also another thing. So in a colloquial sense, it's simply a preference for or, or against something. So um, simply put, you know, I like ice cream, you like chocolate. Or I like vanilla ice cream, you like chocolate ice cream. And, you know, we don't really have there's no like issue with that, like really, unless someone can can, can think of something. Um, and the the main kind of bias I want to talk about today is algorithmic bias, which I define as a set of mathematical rules that systematically favors one group over another. So, implicit in in kind of my conversation and my discussion here is is that um, bias is kind of an amoral thing. So it's, you know, we don't really have any value judgments about preferring um, vanilla over ice cream, but a type of bias that is harmful, um, I would say, is algorithmic bias in, in this kind of flavor. So this is an example that was published by ProPublica. Um, I'm not sure if people here, who, who's seen this kind of image and read that article? So that, it was a, uh, kind of a great analysis and, and an example of, of um, kind of trying to reproduce or kind of reconstruct a model and try to understand it a little bit better. But basically, this is an example where um, I think it was a kind of survival model that tried to assess the risk of a particular person um, uh, going through uh, uh, recidivism. So these are prison inmates. and. The bias that the model held was that it would classify black people as having a higher risk of recidivism um, when they, in fact, did not. Um, uh, what's what's the proper word there? But that when they did not go back um, to jail, and it would favorably say that white people had less risk when, in fact, they did. Um, so, just to be really clear here, I kind of want to put these terms in front of you and. Um, kind of just soak it in, and, and I'll kind of go through each uh, and take a little bit of time here. Um, so bias, as I mentioned, is an amoral concept. So it's a, the preference for or against something. Um, whereas discrimination is a moral concept in that it's an action. Um, it, discrimination happens when an action is based on biases that lead to the systematic disenfranchisement of a particular social group based on some arbitrary characteristics. Um, and on the flip side, I kind of do have this hand wavy definition of fairness as the, the opposite or the lack of discrimination. And there's a whole literature on, on all of these three topics in, in social science and, and the legal literature. Um, but today I'll be focusing my discussion mainly on um, this concept of p potential discrimination. So when, when data and a model uh, favorably predicts 
Uh, you know, so with respect to with respect to some kind of target variable like uh, approve a loan, a deny a loan, or hire, no hire, um, discrimination in the, in the machine learning context is when uh, a particular social group experiences some kind of harmful outcome, like uh, getting their loans denied more often than other social groups. So this is a problem because if you imagine a world in which people make make biased decisions, um, which is, I think, the world we live in, and it's just kind of like a natural part of the world, then we're generating you know, b these biased decision records. So we're generating biased data. So imagine a bank loan officer who is you know, against, like, um, doesn't like immigrants and will just deny loans of immigrants. And so when you generate these biased data, and you don't really, you're not really critical about it, you, you, you obtain this data somehow, and as a data scientist, you kind of, um, you're happy to get all these labels and all these decision records, so you, then you train an algorithm on it. That algorithm, even though the, the math and the instruction set of like how you learn an algorithm, that, I would say, is objective. So it's a set of mathematical rules. However, I think the thing that is missed in a lot of these uh, conversations is that there's a difference between an algorithm or a model and an instantiated model. So an instantiated model is a model that has learned and seen some examples of your data. And if that data has, reflects those biased decisions, then it's going to learn those biases. And by the way, this also happens even if you don't include any kind of sensitive attributes like race, gender, sex. Um, kind of the underlying correlations between other seemingly um, not related or non-sensitive features will, will, will get you these biased kinds of algorithms. And then these algorithms will generate predictions, which then feed back into the real world. And you, know, you have this kind of vicious square circle. I don't know. So, so it's just to reiterate the problem. Um, machine learning models optimized only for accuracy. So uh, some, some notion of accuracy, like your model fit to the, your data at hand. Um, reflect and ampl amplify real world social biases. So instead of thinking of an ML model as a black box, I think a mirror is a much more apt metaphor. And I would say a black mirror is a much more apt metaphor because like the TV show, there are all these unintended consequences that can happen when you kind of thoughtlessly, or not even thoughtlessly, but you just kind of take for granted that your labels are true, you know, your ground truth, which we often say it's the ground truth, but I think, you know, I think we need to push on, on that a little bit. Okay, so my proposed solution, partial solution, is a package called Themis ML. It's named after the Greek titan of justice. And uh, Themis was already taken, so I had to add the little ML in there. Um, excuse me. So this is open source. It's on GitHub right now. It's on. Uh, it's kind of a super alpha version. So uh, it's built on top of sklearn. So anyone who's familiar with that API should be able to jump in pretty quick um, and train these kinds of uh, debiased models. Okay. So sorry, jumping back. Um, so I, I kind of defined this thing called a fairness aware machine learning interface. And it's just kind of a fancy way of saying, does your machine learning API uh, support the notion of sensitive attributes and some measure of fairness or discrimination? Um, and not just you know, like accuracy or you know, your typical confusion matrix metrics, things like that. So a couple of things that I, I, I thought about when designing this, this, um, this package is uh, these three things. So what I mean, about, what I mean by model flexibility is that uh, depending on the user, you might have full control over your, your model training process, in which case uh, you, know, you work at a, a, a company and you're using kind of lower level libraries and you ha actually have access to you know, the objective function and your learning algorithm. So, so that's great. But if you're using kind of an out-of-the-box solution, 
then you might want to, to have the ability to use different models that um, don't really depend on some of these fairness aware techniques. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. But model flexibility is about different use cases. Do I want to pre-process my data so that you kind of scrub a little bit of the correlations between your features and your um, protected attributes? So um, again, just to, to clarify the terminology, a protected class is like a legal um, concept, uh, such as race, religion, gender. There are, I think, 20 or so of these um, in, in US law. OK, the second point is um, thinking about fairness as performance. So uh, as an ML person, I am very happy when I get like a 99% accuracy on my, you know, my test set. And um, I think thinking about fairness as a measure of performance is, like, this is kind of vague in my own mind at this point, but I think ways of, of including both uh, accuracy and fairness in, in the training process and, and in modeling in general, I think is an important move. Um, and then finally, there's this thing called the fairness utility trade-off. And so, in some techniques, it's very noticeable. In others, it's, it's less of a, there's less of an association here. But mainly, it's the idea that the, the fairer your algorithm is, the less accurately it's going to perform. It's a, the basic idea. OK. so. What is an fMLI? Um, the way I like to think of it is there are kind of these two orthogonal concerns. So one is discrimination discovery. So even before you train a model, you want to get a sense. And this is, this is kind of where traditional statistics blends in with machine learning a little bit, because you start caring about confidence intervals. You know? Whereas in machine learning, you're, you, do, you still do, but it's, it's less of an emphasis. Um, so the objective of, of discrimination discovery is given a set of decision records, um, x and y. So x is our inputs, y are targets. Um, we want to define a measure of social bias B um, with respect to a protected class S, and then uh, identify a subset of potentially discriminated decision records. Um, so this cartoon at the bottom just says, you know, there are equal number of men and women in this, say, hiring pool. There's some kind of unknown decision process that determines who gets hired or not. And then in the end, you get more men than women hired into, you know, say, software engineering or something. So, so why is that? So that, this, is, this, this is what is at the core of discrimination discovery, is what, what are the, the related features or what are the, like, hi, some hypotheses about like, what's, what's causing this or what, what's um, um, yeah, what's causing this? OK, so I kind of want to make a distinction here. And it's again, this is kind of uh, can be a little bit gray in, in many cases. But in, in the legal world, there are these two things called disparate treatment and disparate impact. And so this is a cartoon that tries to illustrate this, this concept where, um, again, we're looking at a hiring decision process. And disparate treatment is an explicit it's kind of like an explicit treatment of on the job post, it's like only men apply. In other words, we're not going to look at women's resumes. And then, you know, obviously, somehow one woman got through in, in this case. But, you know, so that, that's, that's, this is a, a situation in which it, it's an explicit uh, uh, differential treatment between, you know, social, the, your kind of sensitive attribute of interest, in this case, uh, sex. Disparate impact, on the other hand, is a little bit more insidious because you're like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we'll, get, we'll take everyone's resume. You know, we'll, there's no, nothing explicit about it. But there's something in between uh, sending in your resume and you know, the recruiter making a decision that leads to uh, differential outcomes. And again, this, this is, it's really, I want to emphasize that this is really hard and people like, in economics and social science, like you try to statistically, not even with ML, like try to unpack these kinds of questions, and, and they're not straightforward. So, um, you know, take all of this with a grain of salt. Cool. So, um, some more cartoons. Um, at the so, with respect to disparate impact, um, one can measure 
discrimination at the individual level and at the group level. So um, what I mean by individual level is I'm going to pick two individuals, the big circles, and I'm going to look at like um, disregarding all the this, uh, explicit kind of obvious socially sensitive attributes. I'm going to find you know the nearest neighbors of this particular individual. So um, I'll unpack this a little bit later, but just say we have a sense of distance between these folks, and these are the, the five closest people you know, to this, this one person. Same goes for this, this one. For some reason, I only put three. But at the individual level, I'm going to look at the outcomes of this person relative to the people around this person. And so let's say this is um, hiring again. So these people got hired, and these people did not get hired. But with respect to this individual, all, all the decisions are consistent. And the same goes here. This person was not hired, and all the people around um, her were, were not hired. So that's, that's one way of conceptualizing um, some notion of consistency. So how, how consistent is your um, decision process or algorithm that's generating some predictions? Uh, at the group level, it's, this is you know, the idea of statistical parity. So of, of men and women, what proportion are hired and not hired? And so this gets a sense of, like, at the group level, you know, this, according to uh, one of the metrics I'll be showing in a bit, this will evaluate to zero, so 0.5 minus 0.5. Whereas, you know, if you imagine one of these men up here and one of these women down here, that's going to evaluate to some positive number. Positive number? Yeah, I think so. OK. So that was the first dimension of an fMLI. So it's an API that enables you to easily evaluate your data set. You, the, the kind of heavy lifting that the user has to do is you have to identify your sensitive attributes and then your target of interest. Cool. So the second dimension is fairness-aware machine learning. So these are techniques where you can train a model that is relative to a fairness unaware model will produce less biased predictions. Um, so yeah, I guess you can read the task. I mean, pretty much the same as discrimination discovery, but the, the task is to learn an actual model. Cool. So. Just some preliminary kind of notation stuff, like de defining some terms. So these are like the two, two key assumptions um, that I'm going to make in the context of this um, presentation. And also, this is, these are the assumptions made by Themis ML at this point. So we're going to assume that we're only doing binary classification tasks, because it's easy to reason about, um, where Y plus or 1 is a beneficial outcome, like good credit risk, and Y minus equals zero yeah, is, a, is a bad adverse outcome. So you're labeled as bad credit risk. Uh, the second assumption is you know, they have these two values, D and A, which is a member of the, you know, this set S that um, is also a binary variable. So we're not, again, this is like the very simplest kind of toy model kind of way of thinking about this. Obviously, there are many races. There are many kinds of, you know, things are not binary, even though we like, we like to kind of bucket, bucket things like that. Um, so D is equals 1 is the disadvantaged group. So again, here you have to make an assumption about who the disadvantaged group is in the first place. And then A is uh, equals 0 is your advantage group. So, you know, example here is disadvantaged group is an immigrant, and the advantage group is citizen. OK, so we'll talk about like, discrimination discovery and mach fairness aware machine learning just um, anchored to kind of a typical machine learning pipeline. So this is pretty generic. Um, you have some raw data at the top. You pre-process it. You have some model specifications that you train. Uh, you, then you have your instantiated models that you evaluate. Uh, you deploy it, and you make predictions on new data. So that's you have it, or you have it in production, and it's, and it's serving, you know, its purpose. Uh, how am I on time? Cool. 
All right, so the first sensible thing to do before even trying to train a, a fairness aware model is you want to evaluate, you, you want to measure um, the degree of discriminate, discriminatory patterns or technically potentially discriminatory patterns um, in your data. So one way of doing that is mean difference. And this, for statisticians in the room, looks very familiar. Um, or it should, should feel, feel quite familiar. You're just measuring the proportion of advantaged folks who experience a beneficial outcome, and you subtract from that the proportion of disadvantaged folks in your data, data set that experience a beneficial outcome. So values range from negative one to one, where one is the maximum discrimination, discrimination case, so like all men are hired and all women are not hired. Zero is the statistical parity case, and negative one is, I mean, I don't know how people feel about the term reverse discrimination, but it, it just means like you had your assumptions wrong. So you're, you're, it's like if all citizen, all immigrants got their bank loans accepted and then all citizens got their bank loans denied. So that, there you're like, okay, so who's advantaged in this case? Um, cool, so another cartoon, just to make it super explicit, um, this is, what I showed you sort of before. So zero is the statistical parity case, and then um, any, any positive number means that the advantaged group experiences the, the beneficial outcome um, more often. Cool, the second example that I wanna show about you know, evaluating the discriminatory, discriminatory patterns in your data is um, this, this notion of consistency. I won't read these instructions. I think maybe the slides will be put online at some point, so this is just like a good reference. Um, but another cartoon. So this is how you would cal actually calculate consistency. So um, I like thinking in extremes because it kind of clarifies what's in the middle, um, to me at least. So you know, in the extreme case of a, a completely consistent decision process, you're gonna get a number one and a completely inconsistent, so, so let's look at here. So the, the purple folks are homeowners and then the orange folks are not homeowners. And this is supposed to be you know, your true predictor of whether you should have a loan or not. And um, you have these folks in kind of business formal outfits. But basically you, you look at this particular homeowner and you pick the five nearest neighbors, so other homeowners. Um, and you see, you know, her loan was denied, but everyone else's was accepted, you know, regardless of, you know, the, the sex of these no neighbors. Same goes here. Every, all the neighbors got rejected, whereas this one was accepted. So it's a, by this metric, an inconsistent decision process. Um, there's some, there's actually something similar called situation testing. It's kind of where you take a resume and you, uh, it's kind of like an A-B test for racism where you, you have one resume have like a black sounding name, uh, another resume, have, so that's, this is kind of a similar type of um, test, or like kind of in concept. Cool, so you know, say there are discriminatory patterns in your data, so, so what, what can you do about it? There are three kind of entry points for you know, the famous ML API where you can Pre-process your change the way you're, you're pre-processing your data. Um, I'll mention all caveats after I've described these uh, techniques. But the first one is relabeling, and again, I'll just show you the cartoon instead of reading it out. But this is this is kind of to give an intuition. So on the x-axis you have um, is homeowner, like before, and then on, on the y-axis you have income. The diamonds are women and the circles are men. Green is good credit uh, risk, red is bad credit risk. So you know, you, you take these labels again as ground truth. You're like, okay, these are, this is the way the world should be. And then you learn a decision boundary, some model. You know, maybe the decision boundary should, really should be here, but for the purposes of this, I just drew one here. Um, so that's your model trained on the original data. With relabeling, you're, you make a very strong assumption, which may or may not be true. So you use, you're gonna assume that the labels are incorrect and we should directly change them in favor of the disadvantaged group. 
And the way this assumption works out is, is you look at the decision boundary and you look at some n number of points closest to it. And then the way you translate this, into, this assumption into English is like, this woman got assigned bad credit risk because she was a woman. And so I'm going to go in, I'm going to change the data set directly. Same goes for the man here. So you're going you're gonna to promote the woman, promote. Um, this is all jargon. And then you're going to demote the man. And then you're going to learn a new boundary. So this is, in essence, a uh, kind of extreme version of, of this, in, like in 2D, um, how this th technique would work. So the benefit of this is you can do this once, and then you can train any arbitrary uh, model on these data. There are risks, though. Uh, the second one is, uh, so with relabeling, you're changing the raw data. In post-processing, you are at the prediction layer. You're um, taking a model that had no notion of fairness or discrimination, and you're going to change the prediction. So very similar in concept to relabeling. So what this is going to do is you're not going to mess with the model or the, the raw training data. You're just going to say, we'll have some kind of preset you know, parameter that says you know, how close a, an observation should be to the decision boundary. And you're just going to flip the predictions. And that, in theory, should get you like, fairer predictions. Yeah, so the, the strong assumption here is, is, is similar to relabeling. OK, so before I get into the training, the main reason I, I think the more robust sort of methods are in this category as opposed to relabeling or like the, the pre-processing and post-processing is that with the former two, you're, you're kind of, it, I don't know, it, it feel, doesn't feel very satisfying to me. You're, you're kind of, you have to make very strong assumptions about your data. And, you know, if, if those assumptions are justified, I think, you know, go, go ahead and, and do it. Um, but as I'll describe here, I, I think theoretically these, these training methods are a lot more satisfying. So with the add additive counterfactually fair model, or ACF, what you're doing is this. You have your features, your non-sensitive features X, and then you have your protected classes S. What you're doing is you're training, um, and this is in the linear context, so it just um, whenever you see the word model, just assume that's linear. So you're going to train a, re a residual model that's going to use your protected class S as input, and it's going to try to predict your features X, um, each feature. And then it's going to output some prediction of what those features X should be. In theory, what this is doing is this is this model is capturing the correlation between your protected classes S and X. So it's like, what, you know, if this is a logistic regression model, it's like, what weight do I put race? Like, how much should I weight race when determining zip code? Like, probably a lot. How much should I uh, weight race when determining I don't know, is homeowner, homeowner? Probably a lot as well. But uh, so you get the idea. You get, you get some kind of reconstruction of your initial features X. And you do this operation. You say, scrub my initial features off of the, the, uh, these correlations, like remove these correlations from my original features. And you get you know, this capital epsilon, or E. These are what uh, people call residual features that are, in theory, scrubbed of the correlations between your inputs and your sensitive feature. Then you train this through like a, any arbitrary model, and um, you get your prediction. So this entire system is an, the additive counterfactually fair model. Um, the interesting thing about this that I want to note is that you can use any arbitrary number of protected classes. So um, you're not limited to just one, which is an interesting thing. Cool. And then the name of this one is pretty, it's like my favorite. It's like prejudice remover regularization. Um, so this one, like who here knows about regularization or has heard the term? Cool. Um, well, if you do know about it, then uh, for those who don't, sorry, 
it's basically a technique where in typical you know, linear systems or, or nonlinear systems, you are going to try to have the model not rely on one single feature. So if your model is weighting one feature like has cat um, by a lot, then the regularization term in your objective function is going to kind of tamp that down. So your model doesn't rely on any one feature and hence reduces overfitting uh, to your training data. So pre prejudice remover regularization is something that introduces another regularization term to your objective function. And this is the most math I think I'll have. Um, and I'm not going to go through everything in detail, but uh, that's why I, I put some colors in boxes. Um, so just look at the colors in boxes. So basically, the blue thing is your typical, you know, say, L2 regularization. And what that's saying is don't wait a particular feature too much. And this thing in red, this is, your, this is um, the logistic regression case. So what this is saying is don't make mistakes on predictions with respect to the true labels. So this thing is going to be, this term is going to be large if it gets predictions wrong. And then finally, you have this prejudice index regularization term. And um, this equation actually is uh, otherwise known as mutual information in information theory. But basically, what is this is saying, so if you just concentrate on these two, this quotient, you're saying, what is my prediction given a particular protect, protect, protected class over you know, your prediction, predictions in general? So this should be 1 if, if your prediction and the socially sensitive attribute are conditionally independent. So this is saying don't depend on sensitive features too much to make predictions. So it's similar in concept to L2, but here you're explicitly encoding you know, a sense of, um, you're explicitly encoding your sensitive features into your objective function. So this is what I meant when I said this is the most satisfying because you're basically tr you're introducing a term in the actual learning algorithm that will then give you um, a model that doesn't rely on race as much, uh, or you know, pick pick your protected attribute of, of choice. So this is I tried to like think of a cartoon to represent this idea as best as I could, and this is what I could come up with. So in the red is your fairness unaware objective function. Um, that's the thing without uh, this yellow box. So think of machine learning as just skiing down a slope. And you're, as you're skiing, you're skiing, you're like finding the gradient of, of your cost function, and you're trying to find the, the point in the space with the lowest cost. Um, so that's nice and red. What the fairness aware model, um, the this uh, prejudice remover regularization is doing is it's kind of changing the shape of your function. So let's just say the shape of your function changes to this. And now your lowest point is here. And so now you've picked, sorry, uh, I need to step back. x-axis is the value of your weight of your features. And um, y-axis is cost function. And so what, the, what this is saying is that this is an actual, like, if you hold your true labels to be true and, like, non-problematic and everything is good and happy, this is the point you should pick. And this is, you know, the model parameter setting that you should pick. But then you're introducing this new thing in blue, and you're like, OK, actually, if I care about not being racist, like, this is, this is where I should be in space. And if you evaluate the cost um, at this setting of your original you know, your original objective function, you get a cost here. So this is kind of an instance of the fairness utility trade-off, wherein that you have, you know, your training set and your true labels, and really to get the most accuracy or utility out of your model, you're going to pick this one. But since now you're caring a little bit, you know, or a lot about um, fairness or in, in the, the particular sense that it's encoded in the prejudice index, then you're going to get a, a slightly worse performance. By the way, this uh, term, this eta term here, is literally like how much you care about fairness. So if it's zero, then that term drops off. And then anything greater than that, you're like, 
starting to care about you know, how biased your predictions are. OK. I think I might have time. Uh, so next, I'm going to look at this um, data set called the German Credit Data Set. It's uh, publicly available on this uh, website. So I'm going to go through this case study just to give a sense of how one might think about, you know, go about um, training these kinds of models. And then if I have time, I'm going to do a live demo on a fatal encounters data set, which I thought was pretty interesting. So this is, uh, that data set is about um, fatal police encounters, so people who have died um, during a police encounter. Cool, so there's one binary target variable, credit risk. Um, by the way, if you ever see a label that says good or bad, I would kind of be very skeptical because it's already hard enough to come up with labels, but when you're encoding something as good and bad, that's like highly subjective and you know, I would immediately be suspicious of, of any such label. There are 20, about 20 input variables, three of which are potential protected classes. I don't think being below 25 is technically a protected class, but um, for this example, I, that's what I chose. The other two are foreign workers and then um, female. So th these, I've named these bottom variables um, as binary. Um, so it's either 0 or 1. And 1 is the disadvantage class, as I mentioned earlier. OK, so the first thing, as I mentioned, is there, are there discriminator, discriminatory patterns in the data? Um, and according to mean difference, it seems like there is. So with respect to women or, or female uh, protected class, your mean difference is 7%, which is basically saying that um, women experience, what, what's the target variable? All right. Good credit risk. So women are labeled as bad credit risk uh, at a 7% more, a higher proportion than men. Um, and the, actually, the, the effect sizes for the foreign worker and age below 25 are much higher. Um, this is just, I guess, the nature of the data set. So next, what I did was I trained an algorithm, um, basic, a basic one, logistic regression. And I generated predictions on the test set um, on this trained model. So in orange, you'll see this is uh, the raw data prediction. So uh, the, in orange are, are the values you, you just saw. And in blue are the, the values of mean difference learned by the model. So what this is saying is, there, you know, in, in, case, in the case of female and foreign worker, like the confidence intervals are kind of they kind of overlap, but basically this is saying that the mean kind of point estimate of the logistic regression model suggests that it's actually learn like A, learning the discriminatory, discriminatory pattern, and B, is larger, like the bias is larger in these models than in the actual data. Cool. And so finally, um, I wanted to look at the fairness utility trade-off and, and kind of explain or, or make that a little bit clearer to you. So in green, I picked um, area under the curve as my classification accuracy metric. So that's like how the utility metric in this case, so how useful is your model. And then in orange is mean difference. Lower is better. So well, closer to 0 is better. Um, and with AUC, higher is better. So as you can see, I've trained five different models. I've trained baseline, which includes everything, so all features, including uh, protected classes. In the second one, I, I re removed the protected attributes from the training data. The third one, I relabeled the tar target variables according to that uh, relabeling technique that I, I mentioned earlier. Fourth one is the additive counterfactually fair model. And then the fifth one is reject option classification. And you can see as you kind of use these methods that I showed you, the mean difference decreases. Um, the decrease kind of is more notable in the cases where the mean difference was already high in the first place in, in the raw data um, or, or in the model, the baseline model. But the one thing, well, there are a couple of things I wanted to point out here. The first one is removing protected attributes doesn't necessarily 
reduce the uh, bias in your, in your model. Um, and the second thing is that as your model becomes less and less biased, it's becoming less and less accurate, roughly. I mean, it's, it's not a straight you know, linear correlation, I, I don't think. Um, so that, that kind of is an illustration of the fairness utility trade-off. And you know, as someone who works in industry, like I'm going to look at this plot and I'm going to say, OK, so what's my minimum? You know, AUCs of 0.6 are not great. Um, so uh, maybe I wouldn't use these models in the first place. But um, if I'm, you know, say this is larger. So this is like maybe it goes from 90 to like 70 as you use fairness aware models. This is kind of a tool to think about, OK, what is the business use case? Like what's the business requirement here? Um, can we make a fair model that is equally accurate? So you know, take the foreign worker case or even, yeah, age below 25, and the mean differences are close to zero, but the accuracy is still pretty much on par with the baseline model. So th these are the kinds of things I would think about. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'm not allowed to say what I'm exactly doing at, at Arena, but I'll, I'll just leave it there. All right, uh, how much time do we have? 15 minutes, cool. Let's see if we can get this working. So this is a really interesting project. Um, I'd encourage anyone to, to look at this. But uh, the, here's a website. It's basically this journalist who um, compiled a, around 20,000 records going back to 2000, the year 2000. And basically, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, because actually I, I wasn't able to, to complete this analysis. But um, you have attributes like subject's name, subject's age, gender, race. Uh, and the thing of interest here is this long one called official disposition of death, justified or other. So this is a label generated by the police department, uh, the legal, you know, I think the courts. Um, a couple of different places, but you're either justified, uh, the, the, the fatality you know, was labeled as justified, um, unreported, and then there are a whole bunch of other ones that um, maybe I can look at here. Yeah, so these, these are all of the labels. So the majority of observations are unreported, which is uh, sad times. Um, and then the next around at around 4,000 4, of the observations are, are, were labeled as justified. And these are just kind of the top, I think, 15 of the, of the reasons. But basically, what, I was, what I'm interested in here is, can, like, what, is, what does it mean to train a model against justified or, or other? So what I do, I, I'm going to skip all of this data pre-processing stuff. Um, I'm going to stop at kind of the, the exploratory phase of this, but I'm going to show you this more interesting one. OK, so this is race. And this is mean difference. Um, just to anchor ourselves, basically, uh, one, the y, y plus is justified. So that's like, it's not really a desirable outcome, but it's an outcome that's like, OK, this, the, the person who was killed was a criminal or you know, whatever. Um, and then zero is, is some other reason. So you, know, you saw suicide in, in that list of things. So the interesting thing here is that so the, the more negative the number is, the I wrote this down. Uh, I literally just did this like before before coming here. So um, yeah, so if, if the number is negative, it means that black people were labeled justified more often than not non-black people. And this is the only racial category that has this. I mean, you know, the confidence intervals on, on the rest of them are, are pretty wide. The point estimate, though, is positive. And so this, I'm not, you know, we're not going to make a classifier out of this in any time soon. But I thought it was an interesting thing where it's kind of like 
you know, this is, these are my own biases coming out, but it's kind of like the court or whoever labeled this, the police officers, whoever, this is a story I'm telling myself, is that they, they, like, they more often said that killing a black person was justified. This is a very stylized interpretation, so, you know, again, take it for a grain of salt, but I was not, I honestly was not expecting this, this outcome. Um, I think I'm gonna skip, there's another section about mental illness. Uh, I think I'm just gonna jump back to my presentation. Um, cool. All right, so great. We can like measure stuff and then we can de-bias algorithms, so now what? I think the thing we don't wanna do is just kind of like hammer everything down with the, you know this hammer. Um, and I guess in the next couple of slides I kind of wanna give a, a sketch of like how an fMLI of, uh, as a service might work. So this is like a use case, so say as a law enforcement agency, I need to identify individuals who are more likely, most likely to be connected to a gang X, for example. Um, set aside for now what you would do with this tool, because I think the, tool, the, the algorithm itself is like, a, it's an issue in itself. Even if you came up with the fairest algorithm, it really depends on how you use the tool. So are you sending police, pe like policemen over to, you know, police officers over to like black neighborhoods as a response to this model? You know, so, so you know, uh, I'm gonna caveat with, with that. Basically, there are two stakeholders in the system. There are organizations, you know, private, nonprofit government. They have the data. And here you have a third party predictive service. They have, you know, the software and the models. And the organizations will make a contract, some kind of agreement to, you know, say, here's our data, make some models, make predictions for us. The first use case of an FMLI is. I'm imagining, you know, the government agency that I'm mentioning doesn't necessarily have like strong tech infrastructure and, you know, the most that they want to do with their data is I want to measure the degree to which my data contain uh, discriminatory patterns. So they would use a web service like this to measure, you know, feed in the data, you feed in your sensitive attributes and the outcome of interest that you're trying to predict for. So that's, you know, that's one idea. The other idea is that this could be used by the third party service, actually, to do all of these things. So this, this web service, you know, exposes these as part of their API, for example. So say you can call API and say measure, and here's your data payload, and then it, you know, gives you back some kind of response. So the third party service can use this fMLI web service to do everything from measuring discriminatory patterns, fitting models that are fair, even learning fair representation. So I, I'm not sure if there's too much work on this, but you know, I, an idea would be um, you can train, say, a neural net model that has a hidden layer that has the prejudice remover regularizers um, encoded in, in the, the activations of those layers. And then, in theory, I don't know if anyone's done this, but in theory, you would learn a representation of your data that you can transfer you know, to the other use cases. So in this case, you know, the fMLI web service would return you know, feature, fair feature representations or even models um, that the, the third party predictive service could, could use. Cool, so I'm gonna wrap up pretty soon, but I think these are some pretty cool future directions in this field. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of them, so I'll just briefly kind of touch on each one. I think the first one is important because I'm not sure if anyone caught this, but basically pretty much all of the fairness measures that I mentioned earlier assume that equality is fairness, like fairness is equality. Um, and that, I think for many cases that is true, um, but you know, take the case of 9-11 victims. A lot of them suffered chronic illnesses afterwards, and I think this is an actual case where there was some fund, government fund that, had to want, that needed to allocate money to victims. Are you, gonna be, are you gonna allocate the money equally? Are you gonna 
say that fairness actually in this case is you know, the medical bill, like the, the medical conditions that were suffered per family or per individual. So this, it gets pretty, pretty messy pretty fast, you know, if you think of cases, a little bit more nuanced cases, where equality is ne ne not necessarily fair. Um, the second one is multiple sensitive attributes. Uh, not much more to say about that, except that it ties in with multi-valued multi categorical sensitive attributes. So this is taking race, and then you know it's not just black, white. It's black, white, Asian, Latino, like what, however you want to, to discretize it. And so I think more work has to be done in this particular area, because right now most measures are just they assume binary, binary um, variables. Um, I'm going to skip most of these. I guess you can uh, chat with me later if you're interested in, in any of these. Um, an interesting one, actually, that I have tossed, tossed around in bed at night thinking about a little bit is this fairness-aware generative modeling. So who here has heard of GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks? So these are models that are it's technically unsupervised, but some people argue there's like a kind of supervised-esque component to it. But basically, you're showing real images. And I'm totally going to butcher this. But basically, the, the model learns how to generate realistic images based on what the images you show it. So if you show it a bunch of faces, it'll learn how to generate faces in a nutshell. Um, so this is interesting because if you're trying to come up with a facial you know, recognition software, you could go about it by collecting a lot of training data of all races, so like including all you know, the diversity of, of all our beautiful face shapes. And the model is going to learn about that. And if you're, trying to, if you're trying to train a supervised model that recognizes faces, maybe if you haven't shown it any faces of you know, Southeast Asian person, then it's not going to recognize my face. And then my iPhone won't unlock and, and things like that. Obviously, this doesn't happen. But It'd be interesting to look into ways of creating a generative model that has a notion of, like, even if it hasn't been shown Southeast Asian faces, somehow you can modify the, somehow you can learn a model that is still able to learn those by kind of synthesizing data and um, kind of augmenting your data set by kind of manipulating faces. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to, I'm rambling. Um, I'm going to close with this. So to me, the most interesting part of this area is you're basically trying to, this is basically the task. You're trying to take ethics and values, try to turn it to math. And then you're trying to turn those mathematical formulations into like a model that exists in the real world. And I think this exercise is really interesting to me. There are, there are a lot of areas, you know, disciplines, uh, sectors of society that with, in which like, this process of translating ethics into math is really like we need all these things to, to figure it out. And um, what I mentioned today is kind of just scratching the surface and is a very kind of simplified toy environment with which we can start kind of thinking about these issues. Sorry, I, I lied. Um, this is what I'll end with. So if you're a data scientist or a statistician or if you're um, going into, into this, this area at all, um, these are some of the questions that I think are super important to ask um, in one's analysis and model building process. So you can read them, but I think this one is really important. It's like, who labeled my data in the first place? Or like, what process generated these labels? Because again, these algorithms are excellent at like, optimizing and finding the, 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 the place in model space that pre like, pre predicts very well, given that those are the labels that you really want. So I don't really have any prescriptions on like how to solve this problem if you determine that your labeled data is actually incorrect. 
Um, but I think that's something we need to be cognizant of. And then finally, I think the, other, the last one I want to emphasize is the second to last one. So what, what do my predictions mean? And how can, how can they be misinterpreted or misused by the end user? So you know, take, take the higher, not higher recommendation. Like, if the model outputs 0 0.52, like what does that mean? I mean, was, is the person likely to be hired? Like if you have a, a 0.5 threshold, you know, that, that label will be one. So this kind of puts emphasis on product people, not only data scientists, to figure out what kind of user interface, how do you communicate to a user who doesn't know anything about machine learning, what this prediction that they're looking at you know, means and how they should use it. And with that, I'll end. Um, thanks so much for coming in this, this really cold day. Uh, you can reach me at, at Twitter. I'm really not on it that often, but if, if you have any more questions, you can, you can ping me on there. Thanks. Oh, questions. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, so very interesting. Thanks a lot. Kind of related to one thing that you showed, which I forgot the name of that word. So this was basically the concept of trying to estimate what part of your X data is explained by your X, and then by the crap, and correct that, and then reduce it, like ruin it by just subtracting. So it makes sense because you're assuming a linear model. Fine, but what happens when that X data is not numerical, but categorical? So for instance, I was thinking about an example, uh, zip codes are the X data, and then the class is race. So this would be, uh, if this were to be a linear model, it would be like a basic regression, and each zip code is a category, but there would be three possible zip codes. Fine, so how would you reduce, how would you subtract that? Does it apply in these cases? If I am, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, so I, 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 so in the example you mentioned with zip code, uh, I'm assuming you're one hot encoding the zip code values. So you have, say you have like a hundred unique zip codes, and you one hot encode them so that it's like basically dummy variables. Um, I don't know how well this model will deal with that. I feel like it it might, but I, I haven't really looked at that. Yeah, but um, what I will say about that is that I think this, this is like the strongest, this is the, the type of counterfactually fair model. This was like a paper written, um, I think, this year. Uh, this is in the class of counterfactually fair models, it makes the strongest assumption that the relationships are linear. Um, they do have some techniques that uh, allow for nonlinear relationships. I don't know, yeah, I'd have to dig into the literature to, to wrap my head around that. Um, but hopefully that, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a step in the right direction, I guess. So that, that paper, yeah. do you mean, uh, what I guess? Yeah, I'll, well, yeah, come uh, talk to me, talk to me after. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, make sure we're talking about it. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Hey. Um, Yeah. So ACs are different between groups or specific error rates and thresholds. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I feel like there were two questions there. Uh, I guess the first one is, yeah, there are, even, even outside of the fairness aware literature, like one can use stratified metrics. So you can measure AUC stratified by some 
categorical variable. Um, so that kind of gets at how well your model is performing like by group. Um, but to go back to your first question about like other ways of measuring fairness, um, one would have to make a couple more assumptions. So, so let me step back. Uh, there is, I'm kind of piggybacking on like legal uh, concepts, but in terms of uh, fairness, there's you know procedural justice, and then there's um, or procedural fairness, and then there's you know distributive fairness. And under distributive fairness, there's equality. So give equal amounts of money to all 9-11 um, all victims. Uh, and there's the proportionality um, definition, which is you have to introduce another assumption that says what, how, which group, like how do you define need with respect to some, with respect to the individuals in your data set. So, you know, in the 9-11 example, it's like need might be operationalized by, as I mentioned, um, like how many people are in the family or what kinds of men, uh, medical conditions and, and how much those cost to treat or, you know, maintain. Um, so I'll give you a non-answer in that I, I, I'm not sure how, but a step in the right direction would be to somehow encode a notion of, of proportionality. Sorry, that was not a great answer. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. I guess Hi. the 9 11 thing, the, it was even more complicated than that. The notion was also the forward earnings or future earnings. So what happened was that certain people who were at the very top of the earnings curve got more money. Their families got more money. So it's a much deeper and, and at times unjustifiable in, in the world of fairness because I know families of, of workers in restaurants who got nothing. So in the restaurant. Yeah, thank you for that. Life, um, life is much more yeah. Algorithm. Yeah, totally. I, I would say that there are very few there there are a few data contexts in which this kind of binary system would work well. Um, and the closer do you get, the closer you get to actual kind of like laws like anti-discrimination laws, like you can't hire based on such and such uh, attributes. Those cases are, are fairly clear cut, although they can also be really complex. Uh, question, Pierre. So first of all, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. So this is more of like a, a follow-up question. Basically, you know, how confident do you feel about the discrimination uh, model is having? How can you be sure that whatever discrimination the model shows is not caused by the variable that's not involved in the quality? It's also as a patient variable, you know, for example, like you may have a class who has a higher value of approval rate, but that could be because of income, which is not involved. So how do you feel about that? Not great. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Uh, what, so what, what exactly is, is the question? So I'm um, question, I'm wondering, you know, let's just say your model tells me, right, uh, one reason you think get a much lower kind of approval rate. And I'm really confident to say that is a discrimination. Because you have to be some other variable that could cause it to be this discrimination. You know, race variable, but it's not using the model that don't have the data for that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that gets at the question of confounders. So we use, you know, we, we have proxies. Like, we make decisions based on kind of heuristics as, as people. Um, I guess my response to that would be to get that data. But um, yeah, I don't really have a, a straightforward answer to that. That's why I, I kind of, technically, it's it's potential discrimination, 
because it's, it's a bias towards one group, the favoring one group, or, you know, and it's not, it's not like a final say, and, and it's not like a concrete kind of yeah. asser assertion about the model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, none of the techniques I showed really get at that question. That's a much tougher question to get at. What it could say is, like, hey, you've specified these protected classes. Here are some other variables that you wouldn't have suspected to be correlated with it that, that in fact are. So it would be able to tell you that much. And it would be able to say by what confidence interval like the relationship is. Like, it'll give you a point estimate of the magnitude and also like confidence about you know, how, how correlated those, those uh, intuitively non-sensitive features are actually um, correlated with your sensitive classes. But in terms of like a thing that says, oh, your data is bad, don't use it, or try to change it around a little bit, uh, yeah, I don't think that's an easy issue to, to solve. You have one last part of the question where you say that the, the interpretation of the algorithm or model can be interpreted differently. Although the two particulars of the algorithm come from it, say that the, um, all the loans of the emergence are declined. Okay, this the model predicts it. What is the data inside goes there? Whatever that goes in, it comes out with that value. Now, if that does not change, if there is no way I can validate that, then the interpretation would be more and more towards what the model is. It's falling in. Yeah, it's still a little unclear to me, but yeah, we can we can chat okay, sure, uh, sure. later. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is a very large issue of trust, adoption. Um, so, so the second thing you mentioned of, of tracking, I think that's important. I think um, like we track the performance of our models just even outside of the fairness context. So I think it makes sense to, if, if the company cares about this, and again, there's, there's really no way for like me to convince a predictive analytics company to be, say, like, OK, implement this stuff now, because it's likely a startup, which is kind of where I'm working. Um, I'm kind of doing this work sort of on the side and trying to, trying to influence you know, people uh, in my company in, in, this, in, in this direction. Um, so yeah, for, for your second point, I think me like measuring is always 
I think, a good thing, even though your instrument might be imperfect. Um, to your first question, I think it depends on the use case of the company using this kind of software. Um, personally, I think it should, that these kinds of models should influence a decision maker because my, my opinion, and this is just an opinion, is that, uh, and this is well documented where recruiters will hire people more like them or you know, they'll, you'll, you'll learn patterns of, you know, I've been recruiting for 20 years and the, you know, X, Y, and Z are the features that I look at when making a hire decision. And maybe X is actually a true connection and Y and Z are just kind of proxies or correlates to a good performer. So yeah, I think, I think these kinds of predictive algorithms should be inserted you know, into a, like kind of a human in the loop process where um, these kinds of models actually kind of influence the decision made by, by uh, in this case, recruiters. Yeah, I mean, one something that one could do is train a model. That model generates a prediction. And you can do something like keep all the inputs the same, but make this person like, um, like black. How does that change the prediction? If that changes the prediction, if it actually flips the prediction, just changing that one value in the input, then that's a uh, cause of, for suspicion in, in the model. Um, so that, that's kind of, I don't know, so just to be clear, this is kind of a solution in search of problems that we know, we know are problems at the high level, but when it gets, when, when we start kind of specifying that in terms of like actual real world problems, it, it becomes very hard to, to see where these solutions fit in. Besides like just the typical measure, study kind of thing. I have not, not so much a question, it's more about thinking about the ramifications of legal or regulatory bodies dealing with this kind of analysis and saying, hey, your company, why didn't you do this? Uh, also, why didn't you put the threshold for accuracy cost here? Um, it's kind of analogous to the uh, uh, car recalls or something like that, or the grand rule. Uh, sorry, I didn't really, I didn't, didn't quite catch that. You mean, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I missed some so, keywords. So I think. the legal and regulatory ramifications where you can end up having uh, a lawsuit or a regulatory, regulatory body coming and saying, why didn't you do this type of analysis in, in, in the now for coming after you for discrimination or uh, a lawsuit saying that, well, you decided that your accuracy cost was this, uh, you weren't willing to go any more than that, but we think you should have. And then, you know, kind of opening them up to lawsuits or actions. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting. It's, I don't know of, I, I feel like the algorithmic related legislation in this country, like I, I'm not really an expert in this, um, but my feeling is that it's not really well developed. Like I don't, I think it would be a, a great thing for some kind of oversight of these kinds of algorithms. Um, I do know of, there's a, a congressman in New York that's trying to pass a, a bill that says a government agency who uses third party predictive software has to make the data transparent and then also uh, publish the source code of anything that made it. So I don't know if that's what you're trying to get at, but yeah, I, I don't have much of a, like a relevant reaction. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe just like 
would love to, and then hopefully we can take this to the bar and we can talk more. And it seems like there's lots of moral and philosophical issues with this. So. Yeah, this is why I like this topic. It's, it's, not, it's not just like, oh yeah, you know, technical stuff. Thank you. No, yeah, so you're saying that when you're training the k-nearest neighbors model, it should actually, cre it should actually partition those, those observations such that there is no difference between neighbors-ish. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I haven't really thought about that too much. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting thought, yeah. I have a bit of a weird question. You mentioned this in the way of uh, how much Christ the client wants to get rid of again, like in this range from zero to one. So you can just do the uh, active creation of one and just get rid of all the bias bits. But if you set it at zero, Yeah. Yeah, I think one can think of many cases where these kinds of models won't work as intended. Or the, the point of them is to be biased in a sense. So, I mean, I, the, the gang member example, I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Um, but to your first point, you're talking about the regularization, right? So if it's zero, then the, you, that term drops out. And then if it's greater than one, then you start caring. Um, I think it's as abstract and meaningless as the other regularization term. So it's, so like with L2 regularization, a value of 100 is just doesn't really mean anything, really, um, other than you're just saying, penalize you know, high weights in your model. So in the same way, I think with the prejudice uh, regularization, a value greater than one, it really just depends on the data, like what that particular value does in the model. So how that particular value um, changes your, your model space. All right, so um, one more applause for Neil. Thank you. And we'll be going to the AOA board down the street if you want to grab a drink and ask more questions. All right, thank you.